the teacher would tell you she thought you were talented and actually use her free time to put together your first book is a standout moment. But not all hinges are that neon. Most of the time, I think they're a bit harder to recover. They're buried sometimes, and you have to unearth them. I thought just now about suggesting an egg drawing technique I once learned about, but the more I wrote about it, the more I felt like you should be lying down on a couch, and I should have a counselor's beard simply saying, Hmm, yes, please go on. So instead of asking you to color with crayons or unpack your issues, I think we can identify some of your hinge moments by knowing the right questions to ask. Questions I found helpful when figuring out my own hinge moments. Number one, what do I love enough to do for free? That's a cliche you sometimes hear in guidance counselor's offices in high school, but it's no less true. What would you do even if no one paid you for it? I blogged for about two years and didn't make a dime. I didn't need to. I wasn't writing for money. I was writing because I am a writer and that's what writers do. Number two, what do I do that causes time to feel different? When you really get engaged in your something, space and time seem to shift a little. You'll sit down to do a little writing before dinner and the next time you look up, it's 10 and you never ate. Time shifts when you're doing what you love. Has that ever happened? And if so, what were you doing? Number three, what do I enjoy doing regardless of the opinions of other people? Your dream can't be powered by opinion or affirmation. It has to be bigger than the feedback of a peer or a coworker. What would you do even if no one told you they loved it? Number four, if only your life changed, would that be enough? If you killed yourself for years creating something and at the end of the experience, the only life that had changed was your own, would that be rewarding enough? If the experience was the lesson and the journey itself was the reward, would that be okay with you? Is there something that holds that sway for you? Number five, are there any patterns in the things you like doing? If you've got a dream, chances are there's not just one isolated hinge moment in your past. More than likely, you have a list of moments that are similar and related. What patterns can you see in the decisions you've made and the experiences you've loved? Ask yourself those questions. Love yourself enough to actually write down your answers. And when you do, show them to someone you trust. Sometimes we're so close to the painting, we can't tell what it is, and we need someone else to point out the truth. There is a word of caution about the two hinge moments I gave as examples. Those were both happy examples, times when someone reinforced what felt like a dream I had inside of me, or when someone complimented a natural talent I thought I possessed. But don't confuse a hinge moment with a happy moment. Some of my most pivotal hinge moments were not particularly happy moments. They were discouraging moments that didn't create a rainbow path for me to follow, but instead clarified that a particular path was by no means going to work out for me like that afternoon I spent in a real advertising agency. I didn't cry when I got back to the car with my mother-in-law, but it was only because I didn't want to miss my flight. Plus, when flying out of Atlanta, it's always best to save your tears for the airport. It will break you. It's a mashup of Mad Max's Thunderdome and overbooked flights that run on ish time. As in, you'll fly out at four-ish. Or, your plane isn't here yet but should be soon-ish. But that day, I had another reason to get teary. Prior to getting in the car with my mother-in-law, I had spent two hours inside an advertising agency trying to get a job. My wife and I lived outside of Boston in Arlington, Massachusetts, but we wanted to move to Georgia. We'd had our first daughter, the snow was killing my Floridian wife, and it was time to move closer to family. But I couldn't find a job. On my first flight down to have breakfast with a friend's contact, the person I met with refused to accept a copy of my resume. The entire purpose of the trip was to meet this person. And in our unexpectedly terse breakfast meeting, he said, I don't know anyone in Atlanta in advertising. And no, I don't want a copy of your resume. That meeting was not particularly awesome. But he actually did know someone in Atlanta in advertising. His relative worked at an ad agency. And over a period of weeks, I arranged a meeting with her. I spent days and days putting together my portfolio, a copywriter's toolkit to showcase the best work they've done. At the time, I thought working in an ad agency was my dream. 
I was really proud of the work I had already accomplished at a small advertising agency and in the marketing departments of corporations I had worked for. I showed up bright and early at the meeting in a shirt from the look fancy part of my closet. This wasn't an interview though. Nobody in Atlanta would see me for an interview. I spent that day driving around Atlanta with my mother-in-law, who lived there, dropping off resumes and mini portfolios at any agency I could find. I researched the names of a dozen creative directors in the city. Then I would walk into advertising agencies and ask the receptionist to, please give this to Bill Smith. So although I had flown down for the sole purpose of meeting this contact at an ad agency, this was not something formal or promising. I was desperate at this point and greatly appreciated the 20 casual minutes she gave me talking about what it was like to work in advertising in Atlanta. On the way out, she walked me by someone's office and said, you should meet Mark. Turns out Mark was an Atlanta advertising expert. In addition to working at the biggest agencies in town, he taught at the Creative Circus, a two-year advertising master's program. Mark invited me into his office and we ended up talking for an hour. He asked to see my portfolio, the one I had killed myself to put together. I thought, here comes my big break. By page two, he was shaking his head in disappointment. I don't remember if he even finished looking at the entire thing because my head started to spin and I thought I was going to throw up. What I do remember is that he took out two other portfolios, a good one and a bad one. He showed me what a copywriter's portfolio should look like and it was nothing like mine. I wasn't even close to his bad example. Six years into my career and my portfolio was pitiful. At that point, I just wanted to roll out a smoke bomb, slide to the floor, and crawl for the parking lot where my mother-in-law was waiting patiently. But the experience wasn't over. Mark called the admin in and asked for the box of portfolios from people who had submitted them to this agency in hopes of getting a job. It was the size of a coffin for a pony. He then said, Sit at an empty desk and go through these. See what you can learn. In the middle of an office I'd never been in, without cubicle walls, I sat at someone's seat who was out to lunch and started leafing through dozens of portfolios from people who were better than me. It was meant as a lesson, and Mark was incredibly kind to me that day, but it was an immensely discouraging experience. Looking back on it now, I can see how hinge moments like that and a few others changed my focus from advertising. I didn't want to be in advertising. I didn't want to be one more portfolio kept in one more box in the dust under one more assistance desk. Removing advertising from my dream, coming up against that hard wall, subtracting that option from the list of things I was dreaming about helped me focus on what I really loved. I didn't love advertising. I got all the wrong answers when I asked advertising my hinge moment questions. I loved insight and writing. Advertising was just an execution of insight. The core of what I loved to do was insight. And that hinge moment, though painful and shared with my mother-in-law, swung me closer to pursuing what I loved. For some of us, recognizing the hinge moments isn't the most difficult part. We've dreamed about our something for years. We're familiar with the 30,000 foot view. It's seeing things at 10,000 feet and then 10 feet and then from the ground that's so difficult. That's when the obstacles really show up. Anyone can dream. It's the doing that is such a hassle. Chapter 3. What lies between a day job and a dream job. You didn't have to be Scooby-Doo to figure out something was wrong with the house we were trying to buy in Tennessee. The property disclosure agreement, a legally binding document, indicated that there were zero repairs made to the house in the entire time the owner lived there. We wanted to believe that. We did. We thought the house was charming. The neighborhood was adorable. When it was Halloween, they had a big block party. At Christmas, a decorating contest with official prizes. When it snowed, they held a snowman contest. Bluebirds would land on your shoulder when you walked to the mailbox and sing you a jaunty tune. But something was decidedly wrong with the house. How did we come to this conclusion? The owner had written notes in Sharpie on the attic rafters, indicating to repairmen where all the roof leaks were. Ah, but maybe we were just being fancy. It's just the roof. Fair enough. But then we got in the crawl space and found buckets collecting water. How could they have possibly left buckets to collect water and at the same time told us the house was in perfect shape? 
But who doesn't like water, right? It's life-giving. It's awesome. Maybe we could overlook that. We tried to. I promise. But the final straw, or rather the final 98 strawed straw, was the 98-point home inspection list we received. If you've never bought a house, those weren't 98 compliments the home inspector made. Those were 98 things that needed fixing, ranging from minor repair to this house will steal your soul. The smart thing to do would have been to walk, no run, away from this particular house. My father-in-law is a home builder. My mother-in-law is a home builder. My wife has her master's in construction management and used to be a real estate agent. We are not dumb when it comes to homes. And when I say we, I mean they. But we still had a hard time walking away from what appeared to be a money pit. The reason is that we are getting slammed by one of the costs of chasing our dream. Risk. Every dream has risk associated with it. Some might have more than others, but each dream comes wrapped in some degree of risk. If it doesn't, it's not really a dream. The one risk we were facing in this exact moment surrounded our finances. By accepting my dream job and joining the Dave Ramsey team, my salary had decreased. Over time, there was a great potential to make great money, but for the first year or so, things are going to be in a bit of a flux. For the first six months, I'd have a steady base salary, but after that, the salary would decrease and our life would be funded in part by the commissions I made. We didn't love that leaky roofed house, but we were afraid that if we waited too long to buy one, we wouldn't be able to get a good loan. It was easier to secure a loan when I had the first six months of salary to show versus the flip-flop, inconsistent world of commissions. I might believe that I'd make dramatically more in the second six months of my first year, but the bank wouldn't believe that. So we started to panic and thought, we better lock in this loan, buy this house while we can, because if we wait, we'll never get a good loan. The entire logic of that fear is messed up, but fear is rarely logical. Locking in a loan we might not be able to afford would have been an incredibly stupid thing to do and against everything the company I work for believes. Buying a house with a faulty roof, water in the crawl space, and 98 other problems would have been a foolish thing to do. But when the risks of chasing a dream show up and we allow fear to ride in on their coattails, we often make some really horrible decisions. And it all starts with how we decide to look at risk. The magnifying glass, the kaleidoscope, and the telescope. Risks are coming. In the next chapter, we'll talk about some significant ways to mitigate them. But it doesn't make sense to pretend you won't face any. You will. How you perceive them will largely determine how successful you are at overcoming them. In general, there are three different ways we look at risks associated with a dream. Number one, the magnifying glass. Sometimes, when we're afraid of a risk, we look at it through a magnifying glass. We stare intently at it, blowing the possible consequences way out of proportion. We stare so closely at the risk that it fills our entire field of vision. We lose all sight of the possible reward a dream offers. We allow the risk to dominate the dream and define the future. If we failed in the past, we start magnifying that experience too. We do not say, I failed. We say, I am a failure. Friends and family members will try to show us all the things we've lost sight of, but we will not hear it. They don't have the same magnifying glass we do. Number two, the kaleidoscope. The best definition of creativity I ever heard from someone was that it is a wild mind with a disciplined eye. A highly creative person has the ability to feed his mind all these different topics and ideas, then see a connection between previously unconnected things in a way no one has ever seen before. That definition is what makes the kaleidoscope view of risk so difficult for creative people. With this perspective, you look at your risk as if you're peering through a kaleidoscope tube. Instead of brightly colored jewels or mirrors that scramble the image you see, you add in parts of your life. The risk of your dream is no longer a risk that impacts one or two areas of your life, your career and your finances. It is now connected to every other aspect of your life. For instance, in our house situation, when I looked through the kaleidoscope, here's what I saw. 
This house looks like it has a lot of issues. But if we don't buy it, we'll never be able to get a loan. And if we can't get a loan, we'll have to rent somewhere else. Ellie will eventually have to go to her fourth school in four years. Our kids won't be able to walk to school. They'll probably hate a different school and get picked on. They'll be so sad we left Atlanta. The stress of constantly getting rejected from loan offers will probably be a lot of strain on my wife. And in order to find a place we can rent, we'll have to move 30 minutes away from her community of friends. We'll never be able to replace those friends, and we'll probably end up homeless and friendless, and I'll have to grow a patchy beard because I can't afford razors. The end. It's ridiculous, I know. But if you've ever looked through a kaleidoscope, you know that what you see is never what's really there. The same thing happens when you look at risk in this way. Your fears and your worries are jumbled and multiplied a thousand times over until you lose sight of what is really before you. Number three, the telescope. When my daughters were young, they used to be horrible at hide-and-seek. Like most kids, they believed if they couldn't see you, you couldn't see them. So instead of hiding, they would just close their eyes and stand completely still. We often do that same thing with risk, but it's still there. And if we ignore it, we can't plan for it, prepare for it, or protect ourselves from it. That's why the telescope method is my favorite approach. Telescopes are designed to view things that are far away, and that's where most of our risks are too. They haven't happened yet. They're in the future, and they live in the land of what if. When you look at a risk through a telescope, you're able to create a safe distance between your dream and your fears. You can see the risk in detail, but you acknowledge that a lot can happen in the space between you and that risk becoming reality. You acknowledge it's there. You can see it, but you're not allowing it to dominate your decisions. It's just one possible outcome. And by seeing it a long way out, you can make plans to reduce your chances of arriving at that outcome. We'll talk more about a specific way to create a telescope with a risk list in Chapter 8. But before we get there, we need to identify some of the common but unnecessary risks that trip us up. Because risk is what's ultimately holding you back from pursuing your dream. We're going to clear them out of the way so that you can start closing the gap between your day job and your dream job. The problem with perfection. When things were out of control in my room on Edgewood Drive in Hudson, Massachusetts, my mom would ask me to clean up. I didn't tidy or make my bed. I didn't put the obvious piles of dirty laundry in the right room or clean off my desk. I always tried to go from a messy room to operating room cleanliness in one afternoon. I didn't merely pick up books off the floor. I dusted the shelf slowly and rearranged them by size or author name or both. I spent hours and hours on a two-foot square in my room, wanting everything to be perfect. About midway through, I would get overwhelmed at the task and give up. My mom called me a procrastinating perfectionist. I would wait until the last minute and then try to do it all perfectly and at once. And maybe you think that way too. The goal of this book is to get you to do what you love with the life you already have. But there's a chance you feel like you've missed some of your opportunity. Whether you're 17 or 47, there's always the temptation to think that something has passed us by. And now that we feel a little buzz to get things going, now that we feel a little momentum starting to build, it's easy to get a touch of procrastinating perfectionism. And that tends to cripple our ability to finish. I want us to be a generation of finishers. I want us to be a generation of people who follow through and sew the last stitch or give the final keynote or write the last chapter. And in order to get there, we have to murder perfectionism. I was going to write, put perfectionism to bed, but that sounded too tender for this particular monster. Murder feels right. How do we do that? There are a number of ways. Books like Getting Things Done by David Allen are great at helping you get organized and in motion. Men's magazines offer monthly tips on productivity with the least effort expended. But I tend to think that the simpler I keep my tools, the more likely I am to actually use them. And there's one idea that really changed the way I looked at perfectionism. Bumping into this truth radically rewired my ability to finish. Here's what I learned. 90% perfect and shared with the world always changes more lives than 100% perfect and stuck in your head. That's it. 
I admit it's simple, but it's also true. The things you create and share will always outperform the things that stay stuck in your head or your desk or your laptop. You might love the ideas you have inside you. You might be more proud of them than any other project you've ever put together. But if you don't follow through with them, they don't do much good. The business that is open will always outsell the business that is closed. If your goal is to change the world, you have to step out and share your work. And sometimes that means getting comfortable with A minus work. I learned that while working on my blog, StuffChristiansLike.net. I used to kill myself on each post. I would write and rewrite each one, trying to perfectly craft what I wanted to say. It's so easy to misinterpret something online, and I wanted my messages to be clear. It was tempting to hold off on posts until they were perfect. But 7 a.m. comes at the same time every day, and people expected a post from me. Not a perfect post, a great post. If I wanted to impact someone that day, if I wanted to change the way they thought about something, I had to share what I wrote. Even if I thought it was only 90% done. Even if I thought a little more work could make it perfect. Because that's the lie of perfectionism, isn't it? We never tell ourselves the land of perfect is about a year away. We never think perfect is impossible. Perfect always glows from right around the corner. We just need a little more work, a little more time, and then we can share our work with the world. I'm afraid the land of perfect is a myth. We might feel we are skirting its borders with our dream, but the reality is that those borders don't exist because perfect doesn't. Your definition of perfect will not fit mine, which will not fit hers or his. You can't catch perfect, but you can catch published. You can catch finished and shared. That's not an excuse to do your work half-heartedly. I want you to be excellent at passion, not just passionate. But since industry rules say that the vast majority of us don't read beyond page 18 in books and you've made it this far, chances are good you struggle with perfectionism more than doing things half-heartedly. The solution to doing something lackadaisically is not difficult. Just do it better. The solution to perfectionism is tricky because at first it doesn't feel like something that needs to be solved. At first you get lauded for your attention to detail or commitment to excellence. But what a lot of people don't see are the extra hours you're putting in to make sure something is perfect. Perfectionism seems like a character trait sometimes, not a flaw. People don't normally see it as the poison it is until someone burns out or has a breakdown. I look at starting any endeavor kind of like swimming. You can read all the books you want about swimming. You can participate in blogs about swimming and buy magazines and study videos of swimming online for hours and hours. But if you wait until you are perfect at understanding swimming before you started swimming, you might never get in the water. And you'd never learn how to be a swimmer. Because you have to get wet a lot first. Quit perfect. It's an unnecessary obstacle. Chase the idea of your dream being better finished at 90% than perfect and not pursued. The flip side of this idea is something I experienced with the recording of the audiobook. We initially recorded the audiobook and we're close to being finished. We were 40 pages away from done. And somebody I work with listened to it and said, hey, I think we could do a better job. I think we should re-record the whole thing. And my first reaction was, no, because it's a lot of weird, hard work to record an audiobook. And I didn't want to start over. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized they were right. And I was rushing in that moment toward done instead of great. So we recorded the whole thing again, and I'm so glad we did. So don't think that when I say 90% and published is what matters and think that that just means get done, because I don't think done is the destination we want to hit. I think great is where we want to hit, and that's a different place. So in my own life, I really try to keep that in mind, that I'm not going to strive for perfect, and I'm not going to strive for done. I'm going to try to land right there on great. Death to this discussion. Morning John used to hate Night John. That's how I thought of each day in my head. When Morning John would get up to go to work, he'd be exhausted and worn out before the day even really started. Why? Because Night John was an irresponsible jerk. He never thought about anyone but himself. He was always staying up late and watching the real world marathons or reading sports online and then would finally collapse into bed when he was too exhausted to keep his eyes open, thus screwing Morning John out of a productive day. That's how I used to think. 
mostly because I hated mornings, but also because I'm weird. But as tired as I was each morning, there was one thing that wrecked my ability to follow my dream, to move, if you will, each day. It wasn't my lack of sleep or lack of desire. It was the discussion between the other two Johns in my life. Every time I sat down on my laptop to write my book or my blog, I would have a discussion inside my head. It usually went like this. Today, John. I think I'll write some today. Today is a good day to hammer out a few ideas. Later, John. I agree with you almost. I think you should definitely write some. You should just do it later. You'll be able to be far more creative and productive later. Do you even feel like writing right now? Today, John. I'm a little tired, but yeah, I think I could write today. Later, John. You should write, but you know, there's a lot of other stuff on your to-do list. There's a load of other obligations you need to take care of first. What if we compromise? You do a few items on your list and then write later. Today, John. Okay, but I am definitely going to write a ton later. Later, John. Without a doubt, we are going to be so productive later. Back and forth I went with myself over and over again, losing the majority of those discussions. Why? Because we know how to talk ourselves out of or into things better than anyone on the planet. Think about a time when you made a horrible mistake and someone said, what were you thinking? Usually, you weren't doing it because you thought it would be a horrible mistake. You thought it would be great, and you talked yourself into it. Because no one can convince us like we can convince us. So when you sit down to do whatever it is you feel called to do, one of the other main obstacles you'll have to face is the discussion. It's annoying and tricky and sly. It ruins more dreams than just about anything else on the planet. But there is a way to beat it. There is a way to stop it. And the best way to do that, the best way to crush the discussion, is with a decision. If your desire is to read one book on parenting every week because your dream is being the best parent possible, decide on a time to do that. Decide that every morning at 7 o'clock, you'll read for 30 minutes and decide that once for the entire month. Then, on day four, when doubt creeps in and the discussion fires up, say to yourself, Oh, I wish you had been around earlier. We already decided to read at 7 a.m., I'd love to discuss this with you, but we've already made our decision. Thanks. Like an unruly employee at a store who says, sorry, I just work here. You then get back to work. You write or read or jog or do a million other things that are no longer up for discussion. You might need to do this every day at first. We all get a little addicted to the discussion because it keeps us from being brave. We get comfortable with losing to the discussion over and over again. Victory will feel a little weird at first, but the goal is to make your decision once a month and then once a year. The energy and time you'll save not spent tangling in the discussion can be dramatic. Discussing whether or not to create something each day is exhausting. Each time you lose, it gets a little harder to win next time. So decide once and then just do it. Death to the discussion obstacle. The fuzzy math of what if. Secretly, I always thought I could be a writer. That was a passion that I always felt I was capable of executing on. And I really felt that way strongly because I had never tried. There was nothing to prove me wrong. I had a head full of imagination and a life devoid of experiences that told me otherwise. I used to smugly read book reviews or see people online who had written books and followed my same dream and think to myself, I could do that if I really wanted to. It's such a toxic phrase, if I really wanted to. It's a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's not my lack of ability that is holding me back. It's my lack of desire. I could be awesome, if I really wanted to. I could run a marathon, if I really wanted to. I could go back to school, if I really wanted to. We say that phrase when we want to shift the blame for our dream not coming true. It's not that we can't, it's that we won't. And won't is a word that speaks to our will. Can't, on the other hand, is a word that speaks to our skill. By saying, if I really wanted to, we are able to maintain the appearance of having enough skill to follow our dream. This path eventually leads to a curious place, apathy. Apathy seems like a good friend at times. It's familiar. 
We've not cared about other things before. Why not not care about one more thing? It's also much easier than caring at first. Apathy is almost effortless and grows in quiet places that don't require a lot of tending or maintenance. And for a while, apathy is a lot less terrifying than opportunity. Apathy is a good friend when an opportunity stares you in the face and you're afraid to actually find out what would happen if you tried to follow through with a dream job or a desire. And it's a good friend because something weird happens when we step out for a big adventure. We start to ask ourselves the what if questions. What if I try and I fail and it turns out I'm not really a writer after all? What if we have kids and I'm a horrible mother? What if I start my own business and it turns out all these years I've been wrong about being a great entrepreneur? In those moments, we become obsessed with the fear of finding out who we are not. It reminds me of how Matt Damon's character describes why he is a murderous imposter in the movie The Talented Mr. Ripley. He says, I always thought it'd be better to be a fake somebody than a real nobody. Apathy is ultimately about being a fake somebody. We're afraid of finding out what we're really made of, so instead we end up making no decision because neutral is safe. We think that if we don't do anything, we won't make the wrong decision. But not doing anything is its own decision, and the odds of failure are horrible. Let's pretend that you decide to pursue your dream job with all your heart. Let's say that, like me, you put all the chips in and move your family and change jobs and end relationships and start new ones in a new state. Five years later, you look back on the decision, and either it worked or it didn't. There will be shades of differentiation in there, but for the most part, you'll either have succeeded, you made the right decision, or failed, you made the wrong decision. So you have roughly 50% odds of things working out. But nobody fears just making the wrong decision. Through the kaleidoscope, we fear the worst possible outcome we can imagine. A series of interrelated failures, a spider web of screw-ups that collapses our entire being. When I play that game, I go from mistake to hobo on the streets in about five minutes. I imagine losing my job in some sort of spectacular way that prevents me from ever finding gainful employment again. I don't just get blacklisted in one industry. I managed to get barred from every industry on the planet. My family would leave me too because I'd be a hobo and they wouldn't want to be part of my new drifter lifestyle, riding the rails and whatnot. I'd kick around the Pacific Northwest and try to become a glass blower or something, but that wouldn't work either. Ultimately, I'd fall apart and people would use me as a cautionary tale of extreme potential gone to extreme waste. The chances of that happening of you or me really wasting our life to that degree are very, very slim. They're probably 1%, maybe 2% if you already know a guy who's into glass blowing and lives in the Pacific Northwest. Now let's say that your fear of answering what if is massive. You're paralyzed by it, and in order to avoid it, you don't make any decision about pursuing your dream. You now have a 100% chance of your dream not coming to fruition. People who do not attempt to recover their dreams fail 100% of the time. So you have a 2% chance of horrific failure if you try, and a 100% chance if you don't. Those are horrible odds, but maybe I over-exaggerated and 2% is incredibly low. Let's pretend there's a 50% chance that your worst failure comes to fruition. Those odds are still better than not trying at all. You might fail. By recovering your dream and running with it, risk runs with you. You could fall flat on your face. But I'd accept that risk a thousand times before I accepted the guarantee of failure of not trying. Do the math and don't make the fear of failure an insurmountable obstacle. We are too busy to pursue our dreams. I make it a point not to complain about my life around people who have more than five kids. If you have one of those economy vans that prisons use to transfer convicts, and if you have established a precise system to put on shoes at your house, chances are good you're busier than I am. I didn't realize this principle until we had our second kid and discovered that having two kids is exponentially harder than having one.